So welcome back to the last of the series on specialized radiographic techniques. This deals with the very fascinating idea of how magnets or how we have a magnetic content or magnetic personality and yet we don't normally sense that magnet in us. And how to use those magnets in us to find out what's right or wrong with our body is what magnetic resonance imaging is all about. So let us see how this very interesting aspect of nature and human body has been exploited by science to understand and help us understand disease and its processes. So <clears throat> for that, we need to understand a few facts. First fact is that paired protons, every proton is actually spinning. Protons are spinning. And protons being charged particles when they spin, associated with them is a magnetic moment. When there are paired protons, they spin in opposite directions. One spins clockwise, one spins anticlockwise. And they cancel out their magnetic moment. But when you have an unpaired proton, there is some net magnetic moment. Now, hydrogen is present in abundance in our body and it has an unpaired proton. This unpaired proton lends to our body the potential for a magnetic moment. Why potential? Why is there not routinely a magnetic moment experienced by all of us? The reason is that these magnets are randomly arranged. It's only when we put them in a very strong magnetic field that they get aligned with the field, either exactly aligned or in exactly the opposite direction. Now, although they are aligned, they don't just align themselves because they are spinning. And as they spin, as you must have seen when a top spins, it also tends to rotate this rotation which is independent of the spin that is going on is called precession. So precession has an important role in MRI. Now the magnetic field which is used in MRI is of course some newer machines are even 3 or 4 or 5 Tesla but the minimum one which we need is about 1 to 1.5 Tesla. And one Tesla is 10,000 times that of the Earth's magnetic field. So we again display in color what happens when you put them into a strong magnetic field. It's very similar like you have strings which are unaligned. You can't produce music out of it. But when you align them very tightly along this and make them absolutely taut, then you can use this instrument or you can strum it and create music. It is this bow or your finger can be considered as a radio frequency wave which is being used in MRI. And the violin can be considered as the magnetic field. And these wires are the unpaired protons which are present in our body. So as I was telling you, the, uh, this particular spinning proton is also precessing. This is a precession. And if you manage to hit or tap this with your radio frequency exactly as it is moving along this direction, then you will make it precess a little more. If you were to hit the frequency as it is coming back, you will obstruct it and you will make it precess a little less. So, if your frequency is matched with that of the precession, then you can make it more and more horizontal. So, this is first concept that you need to understand. It's very similar to how when you push during the swing. Then you have the concept of T1 and T2 imaging, which is very important in magnetic resonance imaging. It is the basic sequence that you get. So in T1 and T2, as I said in the previous 
slide that if you were to hit this, this will go become more horizontal. And then slowly, because of the magnetic field, it will tend to come back. Some of them will come back faster and some of them will be very slow. It's very similar to a running race. So those who return back fast, very quickly, are fat molecules. And when they return back here, it's called the T1. There are some which, so fat has a small T1. The race is quickly completed. And at the end of the race, you find T1 is back. Fat images are back. So these are called fat images or T1 weighted images. Water molecules are the slowest. So you register a signal over here. So a long time later, you find how many people have still not started their return journey. And those are the slowest molecules and those happen to be water. So T2 has the strongest spin relaxation time. So T1 and T2 are the most basic sequencing that is employed in MRI. And you must be familiar with these terms so that you understand what it deals with. You may not understand all the intricacies of the system, but you can have a vague idea that it deals with how quickly back the processing proton is coming back and aligning itself with the magnetic field. And you use a frequency or radio frequency which matches the frequency of precision. Now different protons will precess at different speeds, at different extents. The angle of precession would be different for different protons. By using different Larmor frequencies, you can separate one set of protons from another set of protons. So it's something like you speak in a language and by using different language, you can see the response. And based on the response, you can say, okay, these are these are all Maharashtians here and these are all Gujaratis here. And these are all Spanish here. And so you are able to differentiate from the resonance, that is from their reaction how they vibrate. Now, this is a very gross way of explaining things. MRI is a complex co concept, but the radio frequency has a specific role. It's like the strumming of a guitar. That's one aspect. And it is resonance. That is, it gives out a signal which matches with a particular Larmor frequency. That Larmor frequency resonates and sends back a signal, which is then recorded by the MRI machine and is converted into a free formatted image. So MRI is as much a reformatted or a computer image as a CD scan. So this is an important point for us to understand. It would not have been possible, but for the fact that we have computers. Now, first thing that we have to understand is that cortex is black. So this line that you see around is the cortex. Now, this is a paradigm shift in the way we understand things. We find that Normally, we are used to cortex being white and medulla being black. Here, cortex is black and medulla is white. And this is the bow-shaped gray articular disc that is being seen. So now we are in a position to study soft tissues. And this becomes a complete paradigm shift. Now, T1-weighted images or fat images are very good to study the anatomic structure of the tissue being examined. However, the T2 weighted images or the water images, water comes out a very powerful signal. Here there is effusion in the joint space. And this effusion gives a very strong signal. Strong signals are seen as white. Weak signals such as cortex are seen as black. Cortex is seen as black in both T1 and in T2 weighted images. Whereas fat is a little whiter in T1 weighted images and water is distinctly whiter in T2 weighted images. So MRI is the method of imaging soft tissues. So we are again giving you comparison. This is the disc which is there. This is the cortex. This is the medulla. Here the medulla, the Blood in medulla is reflected as a high intense signal. 
Likewise, you have a T1 and a T2 weighted image here. You are even barely able to find out the pathology, although you can see that there is some pathology here. But in a T2 weighted image, it gets highlighted. So T2 weighted images are very good to study pathology. So here is a T1 weighted image and this is a gadolinium enhanced T1 weighted image and this is a T2 weighted images. So you can see that in all of them the tooth is black and the pulp spaces are white which again is a paradigm shift. So MRI interpretation becomes distinctly difficult because you need to reorient your thinking. Although the layout of the structures are in the anatomic arrangement, unlike the ultrasonography, MRI still poses a challenge to interpretation because you have to reorient your thinking and understand how each tissue reacts. You will have to see whether it is a T1 weighted image, T2 weighted image, proton density image and then you will have to draw your interpretation. We also have contrast agents as I have already spoken. We have gadolinium which is used as a contrast and it changes the way the T1 signals are generated thereby enhancing certain aspects of the T1 weighted image. So you have contrast agents in MRI as well. Only thing is they are not iodine based con uh, contrast agents. They are a different kind of contrast agent. So now we have three images. One of these three images is actually a CT scan. Now for those of you who find this difficult, you can see that here bone is white. When bone is white, it's a CT scan. When bone is not white or in the center of the bone is white and the surrounding is black, it is MRI. So you have a T1 weighted image which shows salivary gland tumor here and here and the T2 weighted image delineates the salivary gland tumor in a much more distinctive manner. So, we need to understand the T1 weighted images. So, invariably minimum T1 and T2 weighted images are obtained for all soft tissue sections. Further sequences are there for specific conditions, be it the temporomandibular the joint or certain specific soft tissues, which help us to delineate the pathology as per the need of the clinician. So, there are a number of sequences and different frequencies, different repetition and echo times which help us come with different kind of MRI images. The advantages of MRI is that it has a fantastic contrast resolution for soft tissue. Soft tissue is seen the best in MRI. It has the advantages of sectional imaging because there is no superimposition. These are reformatted images. You have the advantage of anatomic representation and multiplanar. You can like the CBCT, it can be reconstructed in any plane that you want. Although you are getting it in sections, you can reformat it any which way. The disadvantages of MRI, it takes a long imaging time. Ferromagnetic substances cannot be used. So person, person has to take off any keychain, any other object which can become projectiles under that strong magnetic field that he is going to be exposed to even before he enters the room where the MRI machine is there. Claustrophobia, it takes a long time and a very sharp shrill sound comes during the MRI and this can make a person scared of the entire process. So this is a big disadvantage of MRI. And there's a steep learning curve so far as the clinician is concerned in interpreting MRI images. So it is also fairly expensive. So these are some of the disadvantages of MRI. Its indications include salivary gland diseases, TM joint disc derangements, TM joint inflammatory diseases. There is something called MR silography which you can do without injecting any iodine containing dye. It is used in say trigeminal neurology screening. So we have to remember that people with cardiac pacemakers or with any form of uh, metallic stents in the heart or aneurysmal metallic clips or ferrous foreign bodies in the eye they are all contraindicated for an MRI examination as long as they have these foreign bodies involved. However, fixed processes including dental implants are okay. Removal processes obviously should not be worn during an MRI procedure. So indications of MRI, neoplasia of the tongue, cheek, salivary gland, TM joint disc displacement, sinusitis, lymph node involvement in oral cancer, perineural spread of cancer, 
and trijunga nirajya also so those was the in brief an overview of this very important imaging modality in oral medicine oral surgery and in medicine in general as dentists there is at least something about advanced imaging which we need to know to qualify and speak as doctors because the public at large our own patients expect us to have some idea of when an mri is done when a ct scan is done whether the plate that they are holding is an mr plate or a ct plate and so on and so forth so this lecture series is to enable you to understand these processes better now we into um some of the obsolete and historical uh, techniques that at one time was considered very important and been an important beginning of all these specialized radiographic techniques ironically it now comes at the end of the series more for the sentimental value that it might have for senior teachers like me rather than any real use to the students but it helps us to revisit the certain basic concepts in radiology so we will take a small trip down memory lane which will also help us to clarify certain fundamental concepts in radiography so when we look at um, tomography forever as in photography we have always wanted to have some things in clear focus and blur out what we don't require so we always wanted to avoid superimposition and tomography was the first attempt before we got into tomography we used certain principles like this is the parma modification of the transpharyngeal technique which blurs out those objects which are far away from the film thereby making the condyle side which is closer to the film to be stand out sharply in the background this was the earliest way of trying to avoid superimposition but there is another way of avoiding superimposition this is a technique in photography called panning where you intentionally move the camera in a particular way whereby you get one cyclist who is traveling at a particular speed absolutely right on but you are also able to capture the fact that they are moving at speed by this blurring of the tissues so this comes by moving the camera in a particular way so there is a similar way in which you can move the radiograph and the film such that you get a slice so when you get this slice it's it looks like a regular condyle but this is only 3 mm or 4 mm of the entire set so so you have something called the fulcrum and a plane of interest so that is your fulcrum and the fulcrum is also the plane of interest so whatever structures lie in this plane is called the focal plane and by rotating it you can get those structures near b very clearly and those structures which are a and c they get blurred out as you can see a dash is on this side on over here and on this side over here and likewise c also reverses its side but b does not reverse its side and thereby you are able to see a overall haziness in which b stands out clearly at one time it was having lesser exposure than ct scan but with the advent of cbct and the kind of clarity you get in cbct the kind of dose that is there in tomography tomography is all but dead and buried so that was a small quick visit so that please you are aware of the concept called tomography the word tomography comes from the word tomos like in microtome like in your oral pathology you have a tome that is a slicer which cuts in microscopic uh, in microns in micrometers so it's called a microtome likewise this is a tome or a slice and a radiograph so it's a tomograph so tomography was at one time very important from it was born scanography from it was born opg and uh, but all this is getting obsolete and it's the era of the new world the era of cbct the era of digital imaging and who knows it may also be the era some day of dental mri 
So I do hope that I see a day when we find newer and newer technology bringing us closer and closer to understanding diseases, predicting its prognosis and being more efficient as clinicians. It has been wonderful joining you in this first series of mine, which has been a learning experience, an experiment and a joy for me. And I do hope that it has been a joy for you too. Thank you very, very much.